name of Christ who calls us. Amen. Amen. Sometimes, <clears throat> on days like this, I get drunk on the beauty of early spring. On the way home the other day, I stopped by this little urban forest. You know, it was the base of a tree, and it was covered with all this lovely moss, and there were mushrooms, and there was a sword fern growing out of it, and it was a miracle. You know, it was just this little world at the base of the tree on a parking strip. And it filled me with joy. And then, getting closer to home, my neighbor's crocuses were blooming. Just an abundance around the base of her tree in the parking street. <clears throat> and then, the other day, I was on my way into the house from the backyard, and I was just blown away by the scent. This beautiful, sweet scent. You know, everything in the backyard just seems so dismal right now. It's all still sticks and dirt. And I looked around to see what on earth was creating that smell. And my little Daphne, a little Daphne in the pot, hardly a leaf on it, was bravely blooming. And the smell was overpowering. And tiny buds. are appearing on those bare sticks of blueberry and raspberry branches. It reminds me of these clouds of baby's breath at the altar here, shining with God's presence. This is the moment that the disciples experienced, I think, in an interesting way, in a, in a different way. <clears throat> but it is though the real world was revealed in a moment, the world that is always there, but that we fail to see and take for granted, and may be hidden by the nature of winter. But it is always there, and it, it's like it comes alive for us. And so in that moment of the transfiguration, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, have the world illuminated for them in a new way. And they experience the reality of Christ's presence. What was there all along, except for that they were too preoccupied to notice. And I think just like them, we want those moments of exquisite beauty and joy to go on and on and on. We hear Peter say that silly thing about wanting to build, you know, tabernacles for everybody and let's, you know, let's make it a, a permanent installation, Lord. But that's not what the moment is about. <clears throat> and suddenly, that divine moment of wonder fades to normal again. And all that is left is the echo of a voice saying, listen, listen to him. Uh-oh, that's never good, right? <laughs> when your mom says, are you listening to me? <laughs> it's not usually because she wants you to hear something pleasant, right? It's usually a wake up. It's usually pay attention. It is as though this gift is of beauty and wonder and enlightenment is given to them, not so that they can just bask in beauty and wonder and enlightenment, we, but so that they have the strength to do what needs to be done next, which as we all know on this last Sunday before Lent, is to get ready for the journey to the cross. It is immediately after this moment 
that Jesus begins to talk to his disciples about his death. And they instantly begin the process of denial and argument and ignoring and all kinds of attempts to put away from them this dark message that Jesus is giving them that he must die. And though it is my uh, sometimes habit to laugh at the disciples in these sermons, they're doing what is absolutely universal to human beings. It is so human not to want to see what is painful. We don't want to face climate change. Nobody does. Nobody does. I, I don't want to. I don't want to give the sermon I'm about to give. The scientists who make their living documenting it, the journalists who report about it, the activists who work to address it, nobody wants to face it. And some people have decided never to face it. But most of us are aware, but we just try to keep it safely at bay. I am a little embarrassed by my own inability with a clear head to see the enormity of the situation. It's like the disciples trying to wrap their minds around the death of Jesus. The depths of our souls and bodies rebel against the craziness that there can be something so drastically wrong with our planet. It is more than we can face. It, it truly is more than human beings, human brains, human emotional whatever. It, we're not designed to face that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're designed to face a particular problem and to fight or flee or freeze as is appropriate to our species in the moment. We're designed to care for our families and do our jobs, to take in something of such enormity that certainly is beyond our control. It's not something we are well equipped to do. I think about how those three disciples on that shining mountaintop were exactly the same three that fell asleep at Gethsemane. That's me. I am in a constant battle to stay awake. I want to go to sleep really bad. You know what's funny? I was so sleepy on Friday. And I didn't figure out why until I was really working on this sermon on Saturday. <laughs> I literally, it literally makes me want to go to sleep. So I'm going to say it. Here we go. The climate of the earth is warming. The glaciers and ice caps are melting. The oceans are acidifying and great changes in the planet's ability to regulate itself are already happening and more is on the way. These changes threaten species and ecosystems on every continent. This planet will not be the same for our children or their children. The damage has already begun. There, I said it. Now let's take a deep breath. And I, I beg you, to stay with me. I need your company for one thing. <laughs> we need to talk about hope now. We need to talk about real hope, not false hope, not whistling in the dark and unfounded optimism, not, oh well, we'll figure it out somehow, but real 
Christian hope. Real Christian hope. That's what got the children of Israel through the Red Sea and out of bondage in Egypt. That's our foundation story in the Judeo-Christian tradition. A story of deliverance and hope. It's what got women the vote. It's what got the Civil Rights Act passed. And it's what makes it possible to have a good and peaceful death. And I have witnessed many of those. The same hope that gets us through real crises and war, we have access to that hope as we face climate change. Real hope is not fixed on a particular outcome as in we can stop and fix it this year. It is fixed instead upon the deepest reality, the reality that creates, sustains, and ultimately surrounds us in time and space, the reality that is revealed by those blooming crocuses and the loud-smelling Daphne. We are God's creation. In God we live and move and have our being. As God entrusted the life of Christ into our hands, that same crazy loving God entrusts this planet to us. We should not be surprised that what we did to Jesus, we do also to the earth. And God never leaves us, never abandons us, never gives up on us. From the very cross, God's love pours out. Father, forgive them. We need to take it. We need to accept that forgiveness and welcome it. Because we've got a lot of forgiving to experience so that we can have the courage to act. And once we experience the forgiveness, then we need to purpose to listen to him. Not just adore and praise and love, but listen to him, follow him. Take up our cross, as the collect of the day says. And when we fall, as we will, I guarantee, as I do all the time, go back to the forgiveness and start again. And when you need to, go back to the crocus. Go back to the Daphne, go back to the ocean, go back to whatever it is that reminds you of the beauty and glory and power and creative wonder of God. And that is how we will make it. That is how we will journey through this crisis. We will journey through this crisis by grace upon grace. By the precious gift of forgiveness and by the empowering glory of God's beauty in creation. And knowing that we are never alone. And that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who came on those other foolish disciples in the upper room long ago. The same Holy Spirit who came upon us in our baptism and comes upon us in every moment of surrender to God's love. Why else be a Christian? If we do not want to grow up into the full stature of Christ and learn to be strong, If we do not claim our baptismal identity as God's children and God's people, why bother to be a Christian anyway? This, I believe, is a moment of great turning. I have heard many people say it. I believe that future generations will look back upon this very moment to be when people began to wake up from their sleep and claim their connection to God's creation 
and work for the redemption of our planet. We are called to do that now, to be part of that turning. And there is so much we can do. Do not fool yourself that there is nothing you can do. There is tons to do. We can do it through our stewardship as we learn to reduce our carbon footprint, as we learn to reduce our collective carbon footprint in this building. We've been doing it for a while now. We can make a difference by our activism and our advocacy. We can use our influence in the world of public policy. But I think most importantly, most importantly, we as God's people can cultivate hope, real hope and practice it in our lives and model it for others and encourage others with that hope. Hope in God who creates the world even this moment. So, we're heading for Jerusalem. It's almost Lent. And we don't know what the resurrection will look like on this planet or when it will come. We don't know. My hunch is that we will not experience it in our lifetimes. But this is the time to turn. I am so glad for Lent. I love Lent. You know Lent means spring. That's what it means. It is the time to embrace the possibility of change and the energy for change that is built into our bodies and built into creation, built into the earth. It's time to embrace and participate and join with that energy. So I pray for you and I pray for me, sleepy me, that we would enter this holy season with fierce courage and determination to receive God's grace, which is for us in abundance. That we may be empowered to repent and to deepen in our love and commitment to care for all people and all creation. Amen. Amen.